Welcome everyone to leveraging SBOM software bill materials for ICS security. Uh, looking forward to sharing some of this uh, uh, material and content with you guys. I, I appreciate everyone taking some time out of their day um, during DEF CON and this virtualized um, you know, experience that we're all going through together. Uh, and I, I just really appreciate you guys um, attending this. So kind of jump into things. First off, uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Tom Pace. I'm the co-founder and CEO of NetRise. Uh, we are a startup that is focused on providing visibility to a class of devices that has historically not had um, very good visibility <clears throat> within them. So things like IoT, ICS, uh, networking devices, embedded systems, medical devices, things of that nature. So uh, prior to that, uh, I was the global vice president of enterprise solutions at Silence, where I traveled the world, basically helping clients uh, solve problems related to product services, threat research, all, all manner of things. Um, uh, during that time also, I handled uh, a ton of incident response engagements, um, specifically uh, uh, many regarding ransomware. So that, that garnered me uh, a bunch of attention and I ended up getting uh, interviewed on 60 Minutes for some of the work that I did there, which was a really cool and fun experience. Um, prior to that, I worked at the Department of Energy doing industrial control system security and other security engineering things. Um, and then uh, before that, I worked at a bank. And, and then prior to that, I was in the Marine Corps, where I spent most of my time in the Middle East doing uh, not cybersecurity things, essentially. So uh, I've also done a bunch of things at RSA, Black Hat, um, other, other conferences uh, of, the, of the like. So uh, speaking of uh, my time in Iraq, actually, um, it's always fun to share a picture of me and Chuck Norris over there in 2007. So uh, it wasn't wasn't all so bad. Uh, it's a much much younger and uh, youthful looking uh, version of myself. So from an agenda perspective, what is a software bill of materials? Uh, then we'll go into uh, market trends that are driving uh, software bill of materials. Like why now? Uh, why is it important now? Um, what what things have happened that are driving this um, adoption and need? Uh, device risks um, associated with not having uh, a software bill of materials or risks that could be reduced by having one, uh, attacks that, that have occurred and attack types. And then we'll move into identifying and discussing the value proposition, the use cases that software bill of materials can, uh, can provide, how do we generate and consume an SBOM, uh, the, the, the challenges associated with such, and then what do I do once I have one? So jump into it. <clears throat> a software bill of materials is basically a complete formally structured list of components, libraries, modules that are required to build, which essentially would mean compile and link a given piece of software in the various supply chain uh, relationships between them. And so in the bottom left here, you can see the relationships um, of the Acme application, uh, where you basically have, you know, Bingo Buffer or Bob's browser, Carol's compression engine, things like that. This is an example um, that is used by um, the NTIA, which is a uh, part of the Department of Commerce that has really been spearheading the Software Bill of Materials Working Group, of which uh, I've been a member for roughly eight months or so. They're doing amazing work, and it's a, a really exciting thing um, that, they, that they've done there and what they've done for the community in general. So uh, on the right-hand side here, you see um, basically a, an adaptation of a, um, uh, an ingredients label uh, for for food that that could could be modeled uh, for software. And so, you know, an example here would be uh, imagine a scenario where you have a peanut allergy, as an example, and you go into a bakery and basically ask the baker, hey, uh, I have this severe peanut allergy. Uh, I need to know if any of uh, this cake that I want to buy or cookies or whatever um, have been made within the vicinity of peanuts or something like that. because You have like a very intense allergy and then basically not being able to tell you. So you have you now have to basically make the decision on whether or not you're going to accept the risk of purchasing this this baked good and putting your your health at risk. Well, that's essentially the state of affairs that we are in uh, from a software perspective. Now, all companies aren't don't have that uh, problem to that extent, but generally speaking, uh, software bill materials are not available for uh, or distributed to the, the great for the great majority of software that is that is created. So, uh, and this provides a bunch of problems, which we'll kind of dive into. So these are things that we do have a bill of materials for. Food, obviously, uh, nutrition labels, ingredients, 
um, you know, uh, various uh, sizes and dosages of different things. Uh, hardware. So this, these are the, this is the bill of materials for a red wagon. Um, so it has all the components and parts required. And then also chemicals. Now this is, this is less of a uh, specific list of ingredients for chemicals, but it is a, hey, here are the things that you need to be aware of. Uh, if you get, if this happens to you from a prevention, reporting, storage, disposal perspective, it has here are the hazards associated with this. And so you, these would basically, uh, you could think about these as potentially like from a comparison perspective, like vulnerabilities associated with the software component from the chemicals perspective. So these are all examples of things that we have a list of ingredients, a list of risks, a list of harms potentially associated uh, with different things in our lives. So, but what we don't have this for in many cases um, are our software and even less so for industrial control systems, operational technology, things like that. So the things that are driving and providing critical functionality for critical infrastructure and oil and gas and power and utilities and things like that are, are especially deficient in this realm. So which one is more important? Having a bill of materials for a red wagon or having a bill of materials for a programmable logic controller? Uh, it's obviously a you know, facetious question, but uh, as you can see, we do have a bill of materials for a red wagon and we don't for a programmable logic controller in many cases, and that's a problem. So diving into the market drivers and trends, why do SBOMs matter and why now? So the executive order that recently came out, um, which was a huge uh, step in the right direction, direction from a software bill of materials perspective, uh, has, the, has the phrase SBOM mentioned 11 times, uh, operational technology is specifically called out. Uh, it also highlights various use cases of a software bill of materials, vulnerability and license analysis, uh, risk management use cases, centralized storage and aggregation of software bill of materials so that you can do things like a higher level analysis and, and have every, all this data in one place. Uh, 5G deployment and adoption is uh, a huge driver here. Uh, we're talking about a significant increase in overall in, uh, telecommunications infrastructure that we're going to need visibility into um, and that we traditionally don't have visibility into. So smart cities are, are going to be heavily reliant on this, and we know that there is an enormous push for that kind of uh, technology in cities. Um, the infrastructure alone here is, is enormous to, to, to even just roll out 5G from a, like, cell phone perspective, let alone all of the other things that people want to do from a, uh, from a smart cities um, uh, perspective. So uh, the other problem here is the adoption from 5G is going to be much faster uh, than, than 4G because there's a higher desire to gain the additional technical capabilities that 5G can provide. So uh, that's going to increase a, a, a huge attack surface that then currently exists. Uh, I, I already kind of mentioned smart cities, but the idea here is right. This is uh, um, the problem you have here is there's a adoption and time to market are really probably are, are almost certainly going to supersede security requirements. And that becomes less of an issue if we have a software bill of materials and we have all of this data available to us that can provide us insight into things that are going on. Um, so if we are going to get things to market really quick and ignore security, at least at the beginning, at least we have visibility in these things. Uh, digitization of manufacturing, like we are here, digital manufacturing exists, obviously, uh, the, this combination of cyber physical systems is, is, is a common trend that, that's being discussed very often. Um, but once again, security is kind of viewed as an afterthought here, uh, even though we all know how important it is. Um, and that's, security is hard, baking these things into the into the build pipeline is hard. This isn't a discussion necessarily that all of these things are like the easiest things in the world, but it is important to highlight that these things are incredibly important. Um, the manufacturing environment uh, uh, impacts that, that can potentially occur are huge here. I mean, you have something like the colonial gas pipeline, which was not, the OT infrastructure was not compromised, but the OT infrastructure was made unavailable as a result of uh, a, a IT compromise. And that dovetails into the last bullet there around IT and OT convergence. So um, even though the OT environment was not particularly, were not specifically compromised in that attack, it was still made unavailable, which 
clearly violates the CIA triad, uh, specifically availability. So these kind of issues are becoming more and more common, and we can't really, um, you know, allow these kind of things to keep happening. Otherwise, uh, not having the East Coast be able to uh, get gasoline and other oil-based products is obviously a pretty big problem. Legal, regulatory, and compliance issues. So there's a huge push here from a, a legal compliance perspective. Uh, you have the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act that got signed into law in December of 2020. Um, you have the FDA um, uh, using the Underwriters Laboratory um, Standard 2900-1, which is a standard for medical devices, which can also be used for other device types as well. You have a handful of NIST um, special publications that um, that approach the like either IoT or firmware specifically, or other kinds of device types and in specific environments in which this is a problem. And then you have uh, international standards standards as well, like ISO, IEC, and uh, ENISA as well. So, from a device risk perspective. How are the market trends driving the risk of maintaining our current approach to device security? Now, we talked about this a bit already in terms of like more devices and, and things like that, but let's dive into a couple specific examples. So a real lack of visibility here. Now, if we're talking about firmware specifically, which is, I think, fair to say the overwhelming uh, set of software that needs, that we need visibility in a, in a software bill of materials for, especially related to uh, ICS and um, operational technology. So the the firmware and the devices that are being powered by firmware that, it's, that are running these devices are often treated as a black box. Um, so does a device exist and where does it exist are common use cases. Um, that's important, obviously. That's why that's the critical security control number one. Uh, but this ignores the, the risk within the device itself. So it's great if we know where a device is and what it is and all of that. But we also need to understand what's on the inside. So we've been approaching this problem from an outside in. And we, now we also need to approach this problem from an inside out. Also, fully updated firmware that's perfectly patched does not always indicate it is without risk. Whereas if you look at something like Windows, if you do have a fully patched Windows operating system, that does provide you uh, a reasonable mo like modicum of security. Like you, you can say, hey, all of the vulnerabilities that are at least known have been patched on my Windows operating system. Now, that doesn't prevent you against zero days and all of those other things, of course. But for, for these kinds of devices, they're not even given that luxury, meaning there could be a litany of vulnerabilities that are very old, um, you know, five, 10 years old, known as end days. Um, and those are not patched and maintained in the same way as like a Windows operating system. And there's lots of reasons for that, but not having visibility into that is, is a big problem. Uh, obviously, no bill of materials. Passing the risk to the to the manufacturer, uh, I have I, I talked to a lot of people who mentioned to me, hey, we're 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 uh, passing the risk off to the manufacturer. Just to be totally frank, no, no, you're not. Um, if you buy a device and are using that device, if you buy anything, anything in the world, you have just chosen to accept that risk. Uh, to go back to the um, the example around going into the bakery, if I buy that cupcake and I have a peanut allergy and there's peanuts in it or whatever, and I eat it, it, like the bakery doesn't get sick. I get sick. I chose to accept the risk. So this idea that we're passing the risk off to the manufacturer is just totally false. It's just, it's not what's happening. And we need to just stop saying that it is. Uh, and this to, to compare again to Microsoft, um, no one says, hey, we're just relying on Microsoft to make sure that nothing bad happens here. We spend millions of dollars installing agent after agent after agent on these operating systems to provide visibility, provide telemetry, and give us an idea of the overall risk posture of a, of a, of a given computer. But we don't do the same thing for these kinds of devices. Now, you can't install agents on all these devices and things like that, but there are things that you can do. And so that's, that's, that's the important piece. So this just kind of highlights uh, what I kind of just mentioned around traditional endpoints versus ICS endpoints. This is not an exhaustive list in either column, uh, but the point being, you have a lot more options to provide a lot more visibility on a traditional endpoint than you do in industrial control system endpoint. So like I mentioned, most of the analysis is done from a network layer perspective of an outside in, 
Um, you have limited options and technical capabilities for endpoint telemetry because you, you a lot of these devices just can't even support an agent. Uh, infrequent updates and patch cycles, whereas on traditional endpoints, you have uh, a million opportunities to, to, to gain visibility as, um, as everybody, you know, as everybody obviously knows. So uh, here's another example that uh, something I experienced uh, while I was working at Department of Energy. Uh, we, one of the things I was tasked with was determining the impact of vulnerabilities such as shell shock, heart bleed, others. We had no visibility into, into our own uh, uh, devices, no proactive announcements about what was happening. Um, I had to reach out to, you know, all of the vendors that were that were running various uh, device types um, with, within the, the environment. And it took a long time to even get answers that were somewhat confident, uh, not even perfectly confident, which was another problem. I, uh, I, I've, I've, I had the opportunity to talk with a handful of people who were on the front lines of this from a manufacturer perspective. And one anecdote I received was uh, from a very large OTICS manufacturer that they had to email 635 people internally to ascertain, you know, where specific versions of, you know, an open SSL uh, binary was being utilized. So needless to say, that is a, that is a not scalable approach and um, makes, makes dealing with this problem even, even more challenging. So an inability to answer, are we affected, which piggybacks on that. So if, if we determine a vulnerability exists, a set of credentials exist, an expired certificate uh, is there, whatever it is, we don't have like a repeatable, consistent process to determine if you're affected. Uh, answering questions can be hard, right? Companies acquired don't have an inventory. So this is something that we can help solve. Um, manufacturers have the same problem as the end user. They're not, most manufacturers don't own their entire supply chain. They are relying on other third party vendors for components and hardware and software and open source things just like other people. So they actually have the same problem as the end user in many cases, which is an important thing to notate. Um, most organizations have 30 plus vendors, They're probably conservatively. Uh, so being able to manage all of this is time consuming, not comprehensive and, and not done in, in, in a way that, that, that really scales. So there's no continuous monitoring or analysis, which, which is, is, I suppose, fairly obvious. If we don't have visibility into things, uh, we have no way to continuously monitor and analyze them. So what you'll see is a lot of organizations will do this via a consulting engagement, which is not continuous, not comprehensive, and only focused on really what's outlined in a statement of work. So aspects that need to be continuously monitored here um, in no particular order, vulnerability identification, compliance, risk tracking, the ability to just ask questions of this data. So here's a particular example with uh, related to a Siemens uh, uh, vulnerability that came out in April of 2020 that highlights that this continuous monitoring and analysis is not occurring. So the device notice date is April of 2020. The vulnerability release date is from August of 2018. This is what I mentioned as an end day. Like th this is not a zero day. This is not a new vulnerability. This is an old vulnerability that is just identified. And it was related to the, a kernel version. So this is 609 days that at-risk devices were running critical functions. So this was not a difficult piece of analysis that needed to be conducted. You, you identify the kernel version and you look up that kernel version against the National Vulnerability Database. I mean, it, it couldn't be simpler. And something as simple as that just is not occurring. So you can see how this provides a giant problem. This is just a, um, uh, you know, as a result of these risks that exist, it's like, okay, so we have risk, great. What are, are there actually attacks happening as a result? And the answer is obviously yes. Uh, so pathway one is you have a targeted supply chain malware attack or, or not necessarily even malware, but putting in like a backdoor, which isn't necessarily a malicious binary, but could just be like hard-coded credentials uh, in a configuration file or something like that. Uh, so SolarWinds is a great example of this recently, obviously. Um, a targeted device vulnerability attack. This is the most common, I think, uh, based on what we've seen. Um, you have like the Mirai botnet, you have Ripple 20, you have all of these various uh, device vulnerabilities um, from, from code that is running on these uh, different kinds of devices. And then you have the infiltration of IT networks across the OT air gap. So you had, you had the, uh, the municipal water 
um, system where they were able to, you know, compromise some things and 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 uh, get access to like the chemicals and whatnot. And then you also have, as I mentioned previously, the colonial gas pipeline issue. So, how can software bill materials help? So, shining a light on this device risk is really what we're what we're after. So from a value proposition, you know, we can reduce unplanned and unscheduled work, reduce code bloat, adequately understand dependencies within broader op projects, comply with license obligations, monitor components for vulnerabilities, obviously, uh, end of life awareness, make code easier to review, maintain a blacklist of banned components, which is super important, especially for things like high assurance environments, provide software bill materials to customers for that transparency, third party risk identification, you can build the software bill materials into your third party risk. So now instead of relying on like a paper based questionnaire that's always like questionable in the amount of value that's providing, um, we can now actually have a data driven approach to to doing third party risk management for the software that we're procuring from these vendors um, and then compliance adherence. And so I love this. Um, I don't even know what to call it like S bomb flower on the right hand side that highlights different um, uh, use cases around supply chain, software development, uh, software vulnerabilities, compliance, uh, all these different pieces of parts. So there's a lot, of, a lot of good use cases here for this data once we have it. So it's, it's, the, it's kind of the age old tale. Of once we get the visibility, once we get the data, we can, we can extrapolate that and solve a ton of problems downstream. So that's what we're trying to do. So SBOM generation and consumption, uh, there's a lot of software development tools that can create S bombs for you easily as you're building code. Going back and creating an S bomb for something that's already been done is, is just a much more challenging proposition most of the time. So, you know, the standards that exist for uh, S bomb, you know, adherence, Cyclone DX, SWID, and SPDX are all well documented. You can go find them online. And if you go look at like Cyclone DX as an example, they have an entire page dedicated to tools that can be used. To generate software bill materials that can be used to generate them from Cyclone DX to SPDX format. There's a tons of opportunities here to, to make this much easier on yourself. On the right hand side, you see this is a set of the use cases that uh, can be that are basically uh, part of the Cyclone DX um, standard. So, in whatever ones you can fill in, great. And whatever ones you can't, you know, uh, prioritize them based on the needs of, of what your customers are asking for. So, this is similar to like the food label piece I talked about earlier, where it's like, here's the contents, but not necessarily like the recipe or proprietary blend, which is a, uh, would be a problem. So from a challenges perspective here, you know, a software bill of materials is not, is not a panacea. It's, we're not solving all the problems. Um, it's, it's another set of data that we can leverage to help identify risk, provide visibility, and, and, and reduce the likelihood of a problem happening. And, and, and allows us to be more proactive in, in, in terms of identifying risk and, and, and mitigating or eliminating it as best we can. So this is not a preventative security control, right? Um, all security controls don't need to be preventative. Um, so if you don't have visibility into something, you definitely aren't gonna be able to prevent it. So it's important to get this visibility first, and then Hopefully something from the data that we can gather here can be integrated with or tied into something else that can help prevent, uh, you know, some malicious activity from occurring. And it's important to realize, right, you know, security logs or logs in general aren't preventative. Vulnerability scans are not preventative. Data lakes are not preventative. SIMs are not preventative. But, but we all have them. We all spend a ton of money on them. And so all we're trying, all that is we're really mentioning here is getting the data for these kind of devices is probably more important in most cases than some of the other uh, devices that we're getting data for. So let's do it. Um, legacy equipment's a challenge, right? You might only have compiled code. <clears throat> so access to source might not be possible for a million different reasons. Um, and so component identification and things like that can be really challenging when it comes to uh, generating a software bill of materials here. But it doesn't need to be perfect, right? Perfect is the enemy of good. And so it's important to make steps or take steps, iterate, 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 make things better over time. And uh, if, if, if something can't be perfect, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, imagine if you're a, a person who has 
has been blind or uh, is, is colorblind, right? We've all seen those amazing videos of somebody being given a pair of those glasses and they can finally see colors for the first time and then we all cry. Uh, that's what we wanna do here is basically give visibility, give people a set of glasses that allows them to see what's going on within these devices serving critical functions in their environment. And so it's possible, we can do it. So some misconceptions about a software bill of materials that I think are worth highlighting here. Am I providing a roadmap to the attacker? So operating under the assumption that attackers can't acquire this data on their own is just, just I mean, just totally inaccurate. Uh, in reality, what we're doing here is not providing a roadmap for the defender. So we're making, the, we're putting roadblocks in front of the defender, whereas the attacker can go get this data. So it's actually the opposite of this. Uh, SBOMs level this playing field to some extent. Um, is this intellectual property disclosure? The, the answer to this is no. We're not providing proprietary source code or anything like that. These software components are just a, a piece of the puzzle that, that allow you know, organizations to identify risk and, and, and understand what they need to defend and what they have. Will this increase my licensing costs? So this awareness allows manufacturers to address unknown licensing equipments. It allows them to address these issues in a proactive manner, not reactive gives them the visibility to make good decisions ahead of time through fees or more favorable terms. It also helps the end users and end clients ensure that they have compliant things. So it's kind of a win-win-win a for everybody from that perspective. So I have a software bill of materials, now what? So a bunch of things we can do here. As I mentioned, once we have this data, the use cases for it are pretty infinite. Enrichment of the data with other sources, third-party sources, uh, vulnerability data, threat intelligence data, things like Shodan, like uh, you name it. Um, operationalize the data. We can send this data to a SIM uh, for triaging. We can, we can set, uh, make it part of our vulnerability management process. We can integrate this data with a SOAR platform. We can integrate this data if we're the manufacturer into like our CICD pipeline. Uh, you know, if a critical vulnerability is identified, then open JIRA issue, whatever. I mean, the, the logic we can think of and build out is, you know, uh, uh, you know a lot. So make decisions based on visibility that was previously impossible or incredibly difficult to ascertain is 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 the biggest one so adding additional monitoring to this device due to a vulnerability push back on manufacturer for lack of license compliance enhance um, third-party risk management data-driven insights for lifecycle management segment a device or a class of devices you now have data to to, to drive better decision making regarding these kinds of devices. And that's what we're really after. Um, so this is what you can do once this is done. So I appreciate everybody taking uh, some time to, to attend this talk. I hope it was helpful and informative. Um, I will be on the Discord server answering questions as this goes live. So please reach out if you have any questions. Um, I will, uh, I guess I should have put my contact information here, but you can reach out to me at thomas.pace T-H-O-M-A-S dot P-A-C-E at netrise dot I-O, N-E-T-R-I-S-E dot I-O. Once again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, speaking with you during the uh, Discord conversation. Thanks.